Hare Krishna. Uh, I am speaking to you today from um, the home of Giridharma Swami. Actually, it's, it's a whole estate here. And uh, near Santa Barbara, and Giridharma Swami has very kindly welcomed me here. So, uh, we've had a little internet trouble here, so I'm broadcasting from my um, iPhone, but that shouldn't be a problem. So, uh, it is Sunday, November 24th, 2019. We are going to begin with the Bhagavatam, uh, first canto, chapter 3, text 42. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So, here we go. One three forty two Sangtu Sang Shavayamasa Maharajam Parikshitam Prayopavistam Gangayang Paritam Paramarshivi. So uh, he, Shuka Goswami, because the last verse said uh, that Vyastev using the Anyway, I won't go into all the grammar. Vyastev uh, made his son, literally caused his son to accept, or in other words, gave to him uh, this essence. And I repeated last time, the essence, the essence, saram saram, the Bhagavatam, which is the very essence extracted from all the Vedas and histories. And his son, Vyasa's son, Shuka, is... Atma Vatam Varam, uh, the best of the self realized. So here now, Sa, the first word in this verse, uh, Sa, he, Shuka, then Satu, Sang Shavyamasa, he taught this Bhagavatam to Maharaj Parikshit. And Parikshit was Prayopavistam Gangayang. He was. Um, sitting on the Ganges, but there is a sort of an idiomatic expression in Sanskrit, praya upavishtam. Upavishtam means sort of something like sitting, and then praya, uh, it's, it's an idiomatic expression, praya upavishtam, meaning uh, basically fasting, going without, as Prabhupada puts it, who sat until death without food or drink. That's exactly what it is who sat until death, where you just, a great yogi sits down and doesn't eat or drink and until they simply leave their body. So that's Prayupavistam, Gangayam on the Ganges. Paritam, surrounded by Paramarshi B, the greatest sages. So now, having glorified the Bhagavatam and so on, now we are entering into what you could call the principal frame of this story. Um, scholars have analyzed, uh, well, have noticed that the Bhagavatam generally, or uh, practically always, uh, is narrated by one person to another person. It can be Vyasdev speaking to his son, Shuka, uh, Shuka. It can be Shuka speaking to Sutta. It can be Sutta speaking to the sages. It can be uh, Narda speaking to Vyasa. It can be Brahma speaking to Narda. It can be Lord Krishna speaking to Brahma. So we have these frames, we have these dialogue partners. And uh, the Bhagavatam, it's a fascinating work because if you look at all these uh, dialogue partners, uh, chronologically, of course, the first would be Krishna speaking to Brahma. And then Brahma speaking to Narda. Uh, Narda speaking to Vyasa and many other people. Narda, for example, sometimes speaks to Yudhisthira. So Narda speaks, or Dhruva, Narda speaks to many people in the Bhagavatam. 
And then you have, of course, Vyasa speaking to Shuka, Shuka speaking to Sutta, Sutta speaking to the sages. And then often the, the, the speaker will refer to someone else. Like once Markandeya Rishi spoke to Vidura, or once Krishna, Lord Krishna spoke to Markandeya Rishi, or once this sage spoke to that person. Or, and so the Bhagavatam, if you, if you try to visualize this, actually how it's going on, uh, we, as the readers or hearers of the Bhagavatam, we are being taken up and down chronologically through all these different frames and frames within frames. For example, uh, Sutta can be speaking to Shona Karishi and all the sages in Naimi Sharani, and he'll say, well, once uh, my spiritual master Shuka told me that, and then we go back to Shuka. And Shuka says that, um, well, once uh, Narada Muni spoke this to this person, and then then that person will say, well, I heard this from uh, someone else, or I heard that this was also spoken to someone else. So the Bhagavatam were constantly moving uh, backward and forward in time uh, to different speakers, and these are the different frames. So it's very interesting. So, for example, we heard in in text 41, that uh, Vyas spoke the Bhagavatam to Shuka. Now, Shuka is going to speak to Parikshi. So, this is interesting because here, at, at 1342 in the Bhagavatam, uh, we're, uh, well, actually not yet. Shuka is really going to start speaking. Shuka will sort of take over in the sense that he'll become the main speaker at the beginning of the second canto. But in any case, so let's move on here. And uh, so Parikshi was surrounded by great sages. So then text 43, having said that, uh, Sutta then says, Krishna Swadam Opagate, which means when Krishna returned to his own abode, Krishna was on the earth. Uh, of course, the earth is his energy, and the earth is within Krishna, and Krishna is within every, every atom of this world. And yet, it's not his primary residence. Krishna does come as Vishnu, and he pervades this world, creates the world, pervades it, maintains it. But it's not his ultimate home. His ultimate home, of course, is in Krishna Loka. So here it said, Krishna Swadham Opagate. When Krishna went back to his own abode, this world is created for us because we have a problem, our lack of Krishna consciousness. So this world is created for us and Krishna is so kind, so loving that he comes to this world and helps us, this very foolish, illusory world. But he has his own place. In some religions, God is conceived of as really almost like human-centric in the sense that what God mostly does, he creates this world for us, and then he judges us. He's the witness. And so God is defined or understood in relation to us. It's really about us. God creates the world for us, and then God judges what we do. So in Krishna consciousness, of course, we have a more advanced idea that uh, Krishna actually has his own life. <laughs> I remember my parents, uh, sometimes when they would go out, and we, I, I, we would, kids, you know, we'd complain, like, no, you should stay here and make sure all our needs are satisfied. And I remember my parents sometimes saying to me, we have our own life, you know, we, we also have our friends. And so uh, Krishna is not simply the creator of a world for us, and not simply judging us or witnessing us, he has his own life. He has his own planet, his own friends. And so therefore it said, Krishna Swadham Opagate, when Krishna went back to his place, his abode, and Dharma Gyanadi Bhiksaha, this is very interesting, he went sort of taking with him Dharma and Jnana. Because you remember that Krishna says that he comes to this world when Dharma declines, he reestablishes Dharma and he certainly gave knowledge in the form of Bhagavad Gita and, and other forums. And But somehow the sages are saying that when Krishna went back to his own abode, uh, what about Dharma? 
who is going to guarantee justice in this world and who is going to teach now that Krishna went back. So they asked that, and this is actually the answer. Sutta is answering their question. At, at the end of chapter one, the sages said, Dharma kang sharanangataha, where has Dharma gone for shelter? That was the end of the first chapter of the Bhagavatam. Where has Dharma gone for shelter? Dharma kang sharanangataha, to what shelter has Dharma gone? And now here's the answer, uh, two chapters later, near the end of chapter three. Kalo, in, in Kali, in the age of Kali, Nashta Drisham, Asia, uh, Nashta Drisham, for those who have lost their vision, literally lost their sight, their spiritual vision. Kalo, in this age, those who have lost their spiritual vision, Asia, this, Puranarka, literally this Purana sun, Aduna, now, Udita, has risen. This, of course, is a famous verse. Uh, we are referred to here, Nashta Drisham, those who have lost their sight. This uh, Arka, Arka means the sun, this Puran Arka, this Purana sun has risen. So the Bhagavatam here declares itself to be the light of the world in this age. This is the light of the world and this is where you will find the principles of justice, of Dharma, this is where we will find out what our real duty is in life and how we can actually be happy. So the Purana Sun. And then the last verse of this chapter, I actually gave a, I wrote a paper on this verse that was published by Harvard Press. Um, so Tatra, Kirtayato Vipra, Viprasher Bhuri Tejasa, Ahang, Chadyagamang tatra nivishta stad anugrahat so hung vak shravayi shami yathaditam yathamati so tatra means therein uh, and so he Shuta is again talking about shuka in two verses ago, he said that Shuka spoke this, taught this, literally made Maharaj Parikshit hear it. He, he caused him to hear it, literally in Sanskrit. And uh, Parikshit, who was sitting and fasting till death on the bank of the Ganges, surrounded by the greatest sages, and then Shuka says, or Sutta says, the importance of this. This is why is it important that Shuka uh, spoke this, taught this to Parikshit, made Parikshit hear it. Why is that important? Because Sutta is saying to the sages, You asked me, uh, Dharma kang sharanang gataha, where has Dharma gone for shelter? Who will protect Dharma now that Krishna has left? And so then Sutta says, all right, here's the answer. This Bhagavatam that Shuka taught to Sutta, that Bhagavatam is the Puranarka. It is the light of this world. It is the sun of this fallen world uh, in this age. And it has now risen. It's very interesting because this actually confirms something that Lord Chaitanya says uh, in the Chaitanya Bhagavat, namely that the Bhagavatam is like Krishna's avatars in the sense that it, the Bhagavatam appears and disappears at different times. Uh, Prabhupada used to give the example that the sun is always in the sky, but it appears to rise and set at different times in different places. So the Bhagavatam always exists, but it, it appears at different times and then it may disappear, even though it's eternal. And so, interestingly, Sutta here says that the, the Bhagavatam, this Purana sun, has risen now, which, which indicates that it, it wasn't really there, it wasn't manifest before. And we know it wasn't manifest before because uh, in, in chapter, at the end of chapter 4 and then chapter 5 of the Bhagavatam, the first uh, 
first canto, when Vyastev was depressed, uh, the Bhagavatam wasn't around. It, again, it's all it's eternal, but it, it hadn't risen yet. And so Vyastev, after hearing from his guru, Narda, then uh, composed the Bhagavatam. So that means before that moment, it wasn't there. It wasn't in the world. It wasn't manifest. And so when Sutta says this Purana Arka, this Purana sun has now risen, this sun has now risen, of course, he's referring to the fact that Vyastev recently composed it and brought it back to this world. So then, so when he says tatra, the reason I mention this is because uh, Sutta was speaking about uh, uh, how Shuka taught the Bhagavatam to Vyastev. Then he glorified the Bhagavatam, but now when he says tatra, therein, so what is he referring to when he says therein? Of course, he's referring to the Bhagavatam. So, and he's, he's going to specifically refer here to that historical moment when Shuka taught Pariksit. Because a sutta here says, Tatra, therein. And, and so therein can mean therein in the Bhagavatam, or it can mean there, there where Shuka was teaching Pariksit. Kirta yato vipra viprasher bhuri tejasam when that, uh, and so sutta says vipra, o sejas, there, when that sage among scholars that Viprasher, who is referring to Shuka, who has who Buri Tejasa, who has extraordinary potency. Extraordinary potency. Tatra ki so when when that sage among scholars, sage among Brahmins, who when he was speaking, glorifying, doing kirtan by reciting the Bhagavatam, that sage of extraordinary potency, ahang chadyagamang tatra. I also learned it there. I also understood it. So this is very interesting. When Shuka taught Parikshit, Sutta, Sutta Goswami was actually there. He was sitting there. He was one of the sages and he heard the Bhagavatam from Shuka who was actually his guru. Ahangcha, I too, Ahangcha, Adyagamam, I understood it. There, he repeats the word there, Nivishtas, I was seated there. I was seated there at that assembly. I also un- heard it and understood it. Tadanugrahat, by the mercy of my guru, um, Shuka. And so, Sohangvak Shravayishyami, so I will now make you hear it. Uh, I'll let you hear it. Yata yatamati. Which that's, and I want to talk about those two words, which are extremely important. Uh, yata ditam means yata ditam as studied, which it sort of means in Sanskrit literally. In other words, as I actually heard it, as I actually learned it. And yatamati, which means according, in a sense, to my realization. So, so I'm going to explain it literally and according to my realization. It's very interesting words, um, which I will explain. One striking feature here, if you're interested in Sanskrit, is the continual use of causative verbs. In other words, that someone causes someone else to do something. And these causatives begin, I mean, in Sanskrit, it's very striking use uh, of this particular grammatical form. Uh, so it begins that Taridang Grahayama Sasuta Matma Vatang Varang Sarveti Asana So uh, it begins in, in verse 41 where Vyasa literally caused his son, Sukha, who was the best of self realized, he caused him to, to grasp it, literally, grasp, gra, two words are related. He caused the son to grasp it, to take it, to understand it, this essence of all the Vedas and histories. And then again, another cause, but then Satu sang Shaviyamasa, and then Shuka caused uh, Maharaj Parikshit to hear it. Again, using the same verb form, which really is 
Again, if you, if you read the book in Sanskrit, it's very striking. And then, finally, at the last verse of this chapter, a Sutta says, the sage says, now I'm going to cause you to hear it. So it's, so it's really using this um, sort of striking verbal form, this causative verb form, you, you, you actually can visualize the parampara, that someone is making someone else understand it or grasp it. Someone is making someone else hear it, and then that person makes someone else hear it. And so the use of this verb in Sanskrit really gives a sense that a teacher is facilitating, is, is really teaching, is making someone see it, you know, getting them to understand it. So it, 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 this, just the verb itself, just the use of this particular verb form uh, shows how dynamic the guru-disciple relationship is, that the guru, if the disciple, of course, is a good disciple, and you can't speak to someone who's sort of head is made out of wood. But if someone's a good, interested uh, disciple, then um, the guru dynamically makes the disciple understand, makes the disciple hear it and grasp it. But now, at the end, the last point I want to make here is um, these last two compound words, yata ditam yatamati, which I wrote an essay on for Harvard, because Prabhupada, as you may have noticed, Prabhupada translations are often not literal. They can be quite unliteral, but they give the essence. And Prabhupada is actually following his own guru because uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur also translated the Bhagavatam into Bengali. The synonyms, he actually gave synonyms Sanskrit to Sanskrit. He gave the Sanskrit verse, then Sanskrit to Sanskrit synonyms, and then Sanskrit to Bengali translation and purport. So Prabhupada really was following his own guru's not only format, the structure of the original verse, word for word, translation purport, uh, he was even following his guru's style of a non-literal translation. So one could say, well, is that really translation? First of all, I mean, according to what... um, According to the dictionary, yeah, that is translation. Because to translate uh, means to express the sense of words or text in another language. So Prabhupada is expressing the sense of it. So one sense of translation is strict literal, which I kind of like personally, in uh, in which one just literally explains, okay, this this is the Sanskrit and this is exactly what that literally means in English. But another meaning of translate is to give the sense of something. So Prabhupada said he was kind of putting purports into the translations. And interestingly, that tradition of, you could say, translating or reciting the Bhagavatam in a way that gives the listener also the meaning, the purport of it within the narration, this goes all the way back to uh, Sutta Goswami. This is not a new thing. This is, in other words, this has always been done. This is the Bhagavatam tradition, what Prabhupada did. And because Prabhupada did that, I, you know, I felt I could take the liberty of giving a very literal translation, but as in my Gita. But, so Yatha Dita, Adhita, which is uh, actually in this verse, if you know Sanskrit, Sutta repeats the same verse. If you're looking on, if you have a, you know, this on Veda base or whatever, the third line of this verse is Ahangcha Adhyagamang Tatra. I also understood, because I was sitting there, and by his mercy, by Shukha's mercy, I also heard it and understood. There was not only Parikshit, but I also heard it and understood it. And so Adhyagamam, I understood, literally, uh, gum means to go in Sanskrit. That's the same as our English word go, ga, gum. And adi means over, so to go over it, literally. To, whereas, if, if you think about it, let's say you, um, sorry, someone uh, unaware that I'm giving a class. Um, so, um, let's see, get my thoughts again. 
Yeah, when you, just like people send up these little drones, like to take films, like, you know, you send a drone up, like even real estate people, if they want to sell a house, they'll send up a little drone and they'll photograph the whole neighborhood. And so, uh, so to go over something, in a sense, means to get a complete view, to see it very clearly, to go over it. And that's the Sanskrit word, adigam. There's another word which means to understand, which is avagam, and, and gum... Just as adi means over, ava means downward, sort of the opposite. And so avagachati, like Krishna says, uh, everything springs from but a spark of my pleasure, uh, uh, splendor. Tattadev avagachatvam, that understand it, that everything springs from a spark of my splendor. Splendor, but the verb he used in Sanskrit, avagacha, which literally means to go into something, to go deeply into something. So it's, it's interesting in Sanskrit, these two words, uh, the word to go with different prefixes means to understand. One is you go over something, you sort of look down and you, you see the whole picture. You see the whole landscape. That's one way to understand. Another way to understand is just to go deeply into something. And both those words are used in Sanskrit. So here, Sutta is using the word to go over to sort of see the whole landscape of something, to see the whole picture. So he says that I also understood there because I was sitting there. And then he said, I understood it, yata aditam, which is the same word actually in Sanskrit, as it was gone over, which in this case means uh, literally. It was exactly as, as, as Shuka went over it. But also yata mati, according to my own realization. And so that's what Prabhupada did. Prabhupada is giving you the meaning, this is what the verse really is about, this is what the point is. And then, of course, in the purports and even in the translations, he's giving his own realization about it, his own thoughts about it. Mati, of course, is from the Sanskrit root man, which means to think, and we get the word manas, the mind, and uh, from that same Sanskrit root, I won't go into all the grammatical details here, but uh, mati, uh, means uh, thought or opinion or view or thinking from the verb to think, man, mati. And so yata mati, according to my own thinking about it, according to my own realization about it. Uh, so, um, therefore again, as I said, when Prabhupada gave his purports and his translations uh, with uh sometimes the purport in the translation, he's really following uh, Sutta. That's what Sutta did 5,000 years ago. So, uh, I'd like to thank everyone. I don't know if I, I'm... Actually, because the internet is not so good here in the place where I am, everything else is good. The prashadam is great. It's amazing, just the... Uh, internet is not so great. Okay, here's the question. Uh, what is meant the Bhagavatam is eternal? Uh, that it always exists because it's the glories of Krishna and sometimes it's manifested and sometimes it's not. Okay, let's see. Uh, like the sun is always in the sky. It's not eternal, but sometimes it's in the sky and sometimes it's not. That That's an analogy. Um... How important is it for someone's spiritual advancement to hear this eternal knowledge through a bona fide spiritual teacher? Some devotees are so disillusioned because they had bad experiences in the past that now they say Prabhupada is the only one who can teach them, that they don't trust anyone else. Can someone attain that understanding by simply reading Sri Prabhupada's books with no extra guidance? Well, first of all, I mean, I don't mean to be insensitive to people that had a long list of gurus that fell down. So, you know, I don't mean to just bash them, but uh, you can't really go back to Godhead if you're a fool. And if there actually are uh, advanced devotees on the planet and you think that there aren't any or I can never know if there are, that's foolish. Because to go back to Godhead, you have to be you cannot be, how should I put it, you cannot be driven by material emotions and go back to Godhead. And so if there are devotees in the world, which there are, there's actually hundreds and hundreds of them, men and women, perhaps thousands, 
I mean, hundreds seems like too little. I would say there are probably thousands of excellent devotees in the world at the present time, men and women. Actually, they're all souls. And um, so if someone doesn't understand that, then that doesn't sound like Krishna consciousness to me. Because if you say, well, I had these bad experiences, fine, I understand it, but you're talking about your mundane psychology. You're not talking about spiritual facts. The spiritual fact is, there are many, many advanced devotees in this movement. There's actually a lot of them. Not everyone is advanced, but there are a lot of excellent devotees who are truly devoted, who are faithful, who do wonderful service. I mean, where's the problem? So if you allow, if someone allows their material psychology, which is understandable, you know, we all have to deal with our psychology, but, but if you cannot get past your mundane psychology and so you blame other people, you blame innocent people, or you say, because this person uh, did something wrong, therefore I won't trust you. Everyone deserves to be judged or treated according to who they are. You can say there's racism or sexism and there's, I suppose, maybe like, I don't know, guruism or something. You see, because the way this question was phrased, uh, some devotees are so disillusioned, they say Prabhupada is the only one who can teach them. Now, it's different to say that my trust has been broken, I'm not able to trust, but then we should also say, that's my problem. If you say, Prabhupada is the only one who can teach you, why? Why, if you say, well, because I, I have these emotional issues, that because some people disappointed me or betrayed me, therefore I have a trust issue. But the fact that you have a trust issue doesn't mean there are no good devotees in the world. There's actually, as I said, probably hundreds and thousands of them. And in terms of people who really are qualified to be gurus, whether or not they're official ISKCON gurus or not, there's, you know, there's a lot all over the world. All over the world, some of them are men and some of them are women. Some are old, some are young. So again, imposing your emotional problem with trust you know, what do you do in the spiritual world? Say, I only trust Prabhupada. So, of course, I guess that person, to be fair, would assume that there aren't bogus gurus in the spiritual world. But, um, I mean, we've all had that. I had a trust problem. I mean, who doesn't have a trust problem? Who hasn't been hurt and disappointed in the Hare Krishna movement? I mean, I, I don't think I know anyone because it's a, that hasn't because it's a big movement. And, you know, in the beginning, because for the first several years of the movement, there was, or maybe who knows how many years, there was, in the entire International Society of Krishna Consciousness, there was only one mature adult, and that was Prabhupada. And the movement spread all around the world. It spread so quickly. Prabhupada never expected that. Obviously, many people were put in positions for which they were not prepared. Everyone, more or less, got burned out or traumatized or, you know, it's, it's, it's a whole history. It's like if you want, you can spend the rest of your life thinking about what some of your siblings did to you or how your parents you know, raised you imperfectly and did this and that. You can spend your whole life doing that. But ultimately, everyone deserves to be seen for what they really are. And so to say that because this person disappointed me, this other person, I, you know, they can't teach me, that's, that's a little childish. Again, it's understandable as, as a normal human response, but then have the honesty and have the, uh, you know, just the decency to admit the truth. That, yes, there are many good devotees by their actions. There are many, many devotees in ISKCON, men and women, who, have not, who do not go away, do not fall down, who are faithfully serving Prabhupada and Krishna every day of their lives, who are helping so many other people, who are working themselves almost to death, trying to help other people. And to say that none of them are worthy to tell me anything about Krishna, it's just, it's just silly. So yes, say that I have trust issues because of what happened to me. We'll all be sympathetic. All of us will understand. But don't take that extra step and say, there's no one out there who's qualified. When you take the extra step, then it's just 
it basically is Vaishnava Parad and it's foolishness and offensive foolish people don't go back to Godhead until they give up their offense their offenses and their foolishness. So anyway, that's how I see it. Be careful what you ask me. Um so those are all the questions I see. Nandalila sending me questions, your questions by Skype. Again, I'm on my little phone here. Uh, Lila Kara, who asks a question every week. Let's see, see more. Well, I'm hitting see more, but I can't see more, so I guess that's the way it goes. Um, oh, here it is. Uh, what would be the best way to control anger? Chantari Krishna, sincerely. Um, Jamuna Pavani, can we understand that this cause, that these causative verbs that express the speaker, that the speaker makes the audience, let's see, I think these little buttons, is what we should do by organizing circumstances for people to listen to, in other words, should we make other people hear, yeah, it's the Sankirtan movement, that's what we're supposed to be doing, we're supposed to be somehow or other getting other people to hear about the Bhagavatam, that's, that's what we're supposed to be doing. So, uh, thank you all very much. Thank you all for listening. It's really a pleasure, even though I, you're not all here in your external forms. But it's really very nice to know that every Sunday we can some, get together like this and uh, share the Bhagavatam. Oh, best way to control anger. Oh, I already answered that one. Yeah, you know, chant Hare Krishna sincerely. Okay, uh, thank you all very much. And uh, hope you have a great day, great week. Hope you all go back to Godhead. 